His comics have been translated into over 90 languages, including Esperanto, and have been adapted into animated films, TV series, and video games. He's appeared on stamps, special issue currency, and even had statues built in his honor. There's a whole museum dedicated to him, as a matter of fact, and if you're thinking Mickey Mouse, think again. Today, we're talking about Tintin and his creator, Hergé. I'm Andrea Gilroy, and this is Comics Crash Course. A reference to Mickey wasn't just me being cheeky. When it comes to cultural impact, Hergé really is up there with figures like Disney and Tezuka. Wildly popular in Europe, as well as quite popular in parts of Africa and Asia, Tintin and his pal Snowy, or Lulu, even managed to reach stateside with cartoons airing on Nickelodeon and a major motion picture directed by Steven Spielberg in 2011. Like Tezuka, the visual style Hergé developed while creating Tintin became a defining aesthetic for large swaths of bande dessinée, though that influence doesn't come without controversy. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start at the very beginning. Hergé was born George Prosper Remy in 1907 to a middle-class, devoutly Catholic family in Etterbeek, Belgium. His pen name, Hergé, comes from his initials, G.R., or J.R., reversed. He said of his childhood, My childhood was extremely ordinary. It happened in a very average place, with average events and average thoughts. My childhood, my adolescence, boy scouting military service, all of it was gray. Neither a sad boyhood, nor a happy one. Rather, a lackluster one. Well, while scouting itself may not have been very exciting, it was where Hergé discovered his passion for storytelling. His scoutmaster saw his artistic talent and encouraged him to submit illustrations to the scouting magazine Boy Scout, which would later be named Le Boy Scout Belge. His first drawing was published in 1922. He was 15. After finishing secondary school, Hergé attempted art school but dropped out very quickly, bored by lessons. He got a job at a local paper, La Vingtaine Siècle, hoping to do illustrations, but instead ended up in the subscriptions department, and he was, you guessed it, bored. He hated the desk job, and was relieved when he had to quit for mandatory military service in 1926. During that time, he began publishing a comic series for his old scouting magazine called The Adventures of Totor, following the strange experiences of a Belgian scout leader visiting his extended family in Texas. The editor of Le Vingtem Siècle saw his work and rehired him in 1927, when he was done with service, to draw for the paper. Now, the following year, the paper established a children's supplement, Le Petit Siècle. And on January 10th, 1929, the first Tintin comics hit the stand. In this adventure, Tintin in the Land of the Soviets, Tintin visits Russia and reports on the devastation communism has wreaked on its poor Russian citizens. For reference, La Vingtem Siècle was an extremely conservative, deeply Catholic newspaper. So while The Adventures of Tintin presented it that itself as a travelogue of a dedicated adventurous young reporter just bringing back the facts, the editorial bent is more that Tintin is a paragon of the superiority of Belgian Catholic virtues abroad. And this attitude is really undeniable in the early books. We'll talk about this in more detail shortly. But it does begin to shift while Hergé is working on the fifth volume in the series, The Blue Lotus. For his earlier stories, he did a little research, but his drawings mostly relied on stereotypes about the regions and the peoples that Tintin was visiting. In 1934, Hergé met Léon Gosset, an abbot serving as a chaplain to Chinese exchange students at a local university. When Gosset heard that Tintin's next adventure was going to be set in China, he thought it might be good for Hergé to, say, meet someone from China. And Gossette's gambit worked. Hergé became very close friends with one of the students, a young man named Zhang Chongren. And beginning with the Blue Lotus, Hergé began seriously and sometimes obsessively researching the cultures and regions Tintin would visit before writing or drawing in an effort to more accurately portray each region. Now, to be clear, there are still issues with stereotypes and representation, but there is a notable shift after the Blue Lotus, and one that generally improves over the course of his career. 
Attributing this shift to Hergé's friendship with Zhang is not an overstatement. Blue Lotus features a character explicitly based on Zhang, named Chang Chongchen, and Chang is one of the few characters outside of Tintin's inner circle to reappear in a later volume, 1960's Tintin in Tibet. Now, perhaps the most important thing about The Adventures of Tintin isn't its popularity, but the visual style Hergé pioneered while drawing the series. It's called Min Claire, which translates to clear line. Min Claire is defined by a few key characteristics. Most importantly, as it's right there in the name, the line. Line width is even throughout Lin Claire and throughout the image, regardless of where the object is in the image or how important it is to the meaning of the image. There's little to no crosshatching or lines for shading, and there's equal attention to detail in the foreground, middle ground, and background. The result is a kind of cartoony, very easy to read style that sometimes comes across as looking sort of like a coloring book or an animated cartoon. Because everything is rendered evenly, everything seems to fit into the world equally, even if an artist's style shifts between areas. And this happens in Tintin, where the characters themselves are very cartoony. Tintin is like a smiley face with a body, but the setting is rendered with startling detail. The style makes the cartoony characters fit into the realistic world. We'll be talking about the reach of the influence of this style in the coming weeks. But now to the hard stuff. And as difficult as it is to talk about, especially in a distilled format like this, we have to. The relationship between the work of art, the artist who made it, and how we as the audience receive it, it's really fraught and really complicated. There are ways in which the creator and his or her intentions don't really matter at all. We've talked about that. But there are ways in which it really does. Loving Tem Siecle was conservative, I've said that. But its editor, Abe Norbert Wallace, well, he was an unabashed fascist and a racist. So those views are present throughout the paper. And unsurprisingly, Hergé's early stories are pretty openly racist and particularly in its depictions of Native Americans in Tintin in America, and especially of the Congolese in Tintin in the Congo. At the same time, Tintin in America criticized the U.S. government and corporations for their treatment of the Native people. Even the Blue Lotus, which, as I mentioned, gets better, is a strange experience. Chinese characters are portrayed with some care, and Tintin actively criticizes white characters' racism toward them. The book's anti-imperial stance against the Japanese is quite a double standard considering the pro-colonial stance of Tintin in the Congo. On the other hand, Japanese characters, who are the villains, are complete yellow peril stereotypes. Later in life, Hergé would redraw some of these early texts, but well, first, the damage was already done with the first version, and second, most of the redos weren't that much better, especially by today's standards. There's also an issue that several of the villains throughout the series are coded by anti-Semitic stereotypes, particularly the recurring character Rastapopoulos. On top of the text itself, there's the question of his job during World War II. The occupying German government shut down Le XXe siècle, and another newspaper called Le Pays Creel offered Hergé a spot to keep publishing Tintin. He rejected them because he felt the paper was nothing more than a mouthpiece of the Rexist party the Catholic Royalist Party that explicitly aligned itself with a lot of Nazi ideology. So instead, he took a job with Le Soir, which was controlled by the occupation government, a puppet government installed by the Nazis. As such, after the war, he was labeled a collaborator. Even though 1934's Blue Lotus treats Imperial Japan as villains, in 1939's King Otakar's Scepter is a thinly veiled criticism of Nazi expansionism, and he explicitly skewered Hitler and Mussolini in his strip Quick and Klubke. Hergé was eventually cleared of these charges when the French resistance leader Ramon Leblanc stood up for him, but other members of Le Soir were convicted of collaboration by the Belgian resistance. And still in 2007, the Dalai Lama's international campaign for Tibet, which works to promote human rights and democratic freedoms for the people of Tibet, gave the Hergé Foundation a Light of Truth Award for Tintin in Tibet, a book banned in China, by the way. 
And they did this in the same ceremony that they awarded the Archbishop Desmond Tutu for his anti-apartheid efforts. <sighs> in short, this is a really complicated legacy. Imagine what it would be like if someone behind something you loved in childhood, something that shaped who you were or your culture, turned out to be maybe a monster, maybe not a monster, but definitely something really complicated. Wait, you don't have to imagine that. So what do we do with this? Well, sometimes we throw it away and try to move on. And sometimes we try to think about historical context. Sometimes we can separate the art from the artist. And sometimes the line that you're able to draw is going to be different than the line someone else is able to draw. I think that the important thing is being understanding of and respecting of other people's boundaries and not expecting everyone to have the same boundaries as yours. We need to be willing to examine why we draw our line where we do. Being willing to look at where we draw our lines might not always end up in our changing them, but we should be honest with ourselves. Because I think that context and truth is always important. Pretending that these histories and facts don't exist, that they don't really hurt people, as Belgium tried to do in the case brought by Bienvenu Mbutu Mondondo in 2007, the same here Tintin in Tibet won an award, when the Belgian government said that Tintin in the Congo was paternalistic, but not racist, that's no good. I don't know if outright banning texts is either. Thinking about how we approach these texts, in what context they are and should be available, how we consume them and where, it's tough work, but it's work worth doing. See you next time.